Most people that have studied the book of Revelation will tell you, the theologians will tell you that Revelation chapter 1 is the introduction to the book of Revelation. And all, all the truths that are in Revelation chapter 1 are, are keys to understand the book, the rest of the book of Revelation. And we read earlier on a, a quote this week by Sister White that says, The Lord does not repeat things that are of no small consequence. When you see something repeated in God's word, it means that God is putting an emphasis on it. And of all the truths in Revelation chapter 1, the one that is, is repeated more than any other truth is that Jesus is the first and the last. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the ending. And Sister White says, Character is thoughts and feelings combined. Thoughts and feelings combined go to make up moral character. And God's people at the end of the world are going to perfectly reflect the character of Christ. And one attribute of his character is that he's the God that illustrates the end from the beginning. And he will expect his people that reflect his character to be the people on planet earth that understand the end. And they will do so by understanding the beginning. And once you understand that Christ illustrates his prophetic word built upon the principle of the, the end being illustrated by the beginning, then you'll have the basic logic to understand why we're saying that the Millerite history illustrates the history of the 144,000 because the Millerite history is the beginning of Adventism and the 144,000 is the end of Adventism and that's Christ's signature. He illustrates the end with the beginning. He does that over and over again. In Isaiah, one of the tools that he uses to accomplish the work of illustrating the end from the beginning is set forth. And on the top of page 21 under Islam and Ishmael you see a quote saying the ancient people, and this is from Isaiah 44 verses 6 through 8. Thus saith the Lord God, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last and beside me there is no God. And who as I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come. Let them show unto them, fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. When it comes to Christ illustrating the end of the world, he does it by employing the history at the beginning of the world. And in connection with that, he appointed ancient people in the beginning of the world to illustrate the players at the end of the world. Ancient Babylon illustrates modern Babylon. Ancient Israel illustrates modern Israel in the book of Revelation. Ancient Egypt illustrates modern Egypt at the end of the world. And <coughs> ancient Islam, represented by Ishmael, illustrates modern Ishmael, modern Islam at the end of the world. <clears throat> now, in Adventism today, because we've been subjected to 150 years of customs and traditions and teachings of men being handed down from generation to generation, Adventism at the end of the world, we're not certain if we want to accept that Islam is a subject of Bible prophecy or not. So if someone's going to teach that Islam is a subject of Bible prophecy, you would think that they have to prove it to their audience. And my first argument along that line is, brothers and sisters, I shouldn't have to prove to you that Islam is a subject of Bible prophecy because it was already established by the pioneers of Adventism and it's represented very clearly on the 1843 and the 1850 chart which Sister White said were ordered by God. That's her words. She says those charts were ordered by God. And on both those charts, um, you can see the fifth and the sixth trumpet illustrated. This is the fifth trumpet. You'll notice right here, even if at a distance, it says Mohammedism. That's Islam. This is the sixth trumpet, Mohammedism. That's the Islam of the second, whoa, the sixth trumpet. And when they corrected the error on this chart, with this chart, you'll see Islam of the fifth trumpet, Islam of the sixth trumpet. Islam is a subject of prophecy. It was identified by the pioneers of Adventism. God's people here at the end of the world don't have to prove that Islam is a subject of prophecy. It's already a foundational truth. All right. But um, the Lord uses the 
ancient people to illustrate the end of the world. He's the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, beginning and ending. And he uses ancient Islam, which is Ishmael, to illustrate the end of the world. Now in Genesis 49, you have that on, uh, on your notes under patriarchal blessing. Um, it says, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which be, shall befall you in the last days. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is it that their father spake unto them and blessed them, everyone according to his blessing. He blessed them. And in Genesis 49, Genesis, Jacob places his blessing upon his twelve sons, but it says that it's an illustration of what's going to take place with those twelve sons at the end of the world. And Sister White comments on this, and patriarchs and prophets, at the last, all the sons of Jacob were gathered about his dying bed, and Jacob called unto his son and said, Gather yourselves together, and hear ye, sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father, that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Often and anxiously he had thought of their future, and he endeavored to picture himself the picture to himself the history of the different tribes. Now as his children waited to receive his last blessing, the spirit of inspiration rested upon him and before him in prophetic vision. The future of his descendants was unfolded. One after another the names of his sons were mentioned. The character of each was described and the future history of the tribes was briefly told. Now you have the two witnesses. You have the witness of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy saying that Jacob's blessings were prophecies about the role that his children would play at the end of the world, only his children at the end of the world, they're not literal Israel, are they? They're spiritual Israel. And we're not looking at Jacob here. I'm just trying to show you that the Lord uses the ancient people to illustrate the modern people, but because we're here, I want to make one point, all right? We've been talking about uh, the 2520 time prophecies here a little bit this week. And we're saying that the 2520 time prophecy was carried out against the northern kingdom, which was 10 of Jacob's son, sons. And then the other 2520 was carried out against the southern kingdom, which is two of Jacob's sons, all right? And Jesus puts in the story of Jacob spiritual DNA, if you understand what DNA is, right from the beginning, right from the beginning. In the story of Jacob, when Jacob is going to be used to illustrate, he's going to be used as the, the father of Israel, the father of the twelve tribes of Israel. He flees from his brother into another country. And he takes a couple wives, does he not? Actually four, but he takes two, right? And how long did he have to go into servitude for those two wives? For one, seven times. And for the other, seven times. And those wives, what's a wife in Bible prophecy? It's a church. So you see right in the very beginning, in, the, in Jacob's spiritual DNA, both 2520 time prophecies are noted right from the start. And if you read carefully the blessings here on Jacob's son, it mentions in there, verse 7 and verse 10, yeah, verse 7 and 10 in, uh, in Genesis 49 mentions that those descendants were going to be scattered and gathered. So the 2520 is right there in the very beginning of the testimony of Jacob. It's part of the DNA of Israel, the two 2520s, the two seven times. So we're, I'm, using, I'm using Jacob as an easy point of reference to see that the ancient people, that there are predictions that are set upon the ancient people that are illustrations of the role they play at the end of the world. And Abraham's firstborn was who? Ishmael. Abraham's firstborn was Ishmael. Now he's not the inheritor of the covenant promises, but there is a prophecy about Ishmael. Okay, and you find it in your page on Genesis 16, 12. And it says, And he will be a wild man, his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand will be against will man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. The first thing, the, the prophecy about Ishmael is telling us that he's going to be opposed to every man, and every man's hand is going to be brought together against him. And what we're saying in all this, brothers and sisters, is that the descendants of Ishmael are the issue that brings the one world government together at the end of the world. Every man's hand comes together to deal with Ishmael. Now we're not saying that, that they do deal with Ishmael. 
What we're saying is that they're the issue that brings the one world government together on the premises we need, we need to deal with the escalation of warfare that's being accomplished by radical Islam and the only way we can do that is through one world government. But once the one world government's in place then we're going to find out that the papacy really doesn't want to deal with Islam it wants to deal with those Sabbath keepers in the midst. All right, But nevertheless the issue that brings the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet together according to Bible prophecy is the crisis that's accomplished in the third woe. And the first woe was Islam, and the second woe was Islam, and the third woe was Islam. And the prophecy of Ishmael is that his hand would be against every man, and every man's hand is going to be brought together against him. So, when we look at Islam in history, this, the, the testimony of their historical record in the Bible, we find that they always bring a blessing and a curse. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time here, but that's in Revelation 9-4 when it's talking about the first woe, when, when the Islam of the first woe is bringing warfare against the armies of, the, of Rome in, the, in verse 4 of Revelation 9. It says, but hurt not those that have the seal of God. Throughout history, Islam has been both a blessing and a curse. If you remembered when Joseph's sons were going to, or when Joseph's brothers were going to kill him, it was the Ishmaelite traders that come by and provide a way of escape for Joseph so he can flee into Egypt and be saved. When Joseph and Mary had to flee into Egypt, where'd they get the financial ability to flee into Egypt to protect Jesus? The wise men from where? The east. And in the biblical record, the descendants of Ishmael are marked as the children of the east. The wise men of the east are the descendants of Ishmael. So in the Bible, you see that Islam, the descendants of Ishmael, is both a blessing and a curse because when God's people were disobedient, then the children of the east were used to attack Israel and, and bring chastisement upon them. It's a blessing and a curse. In Numbers 22... I don't, I don't have this in your notes, but in Numbers 22, Balaam is, a, is from the children of the east. Balaam is a type of Islam. In Numbers 22, is just before the children of Israel are going into the promised land, which is clearly an illustration of the end of the world. And Balaam is hired by King Balak to curse Israel. Does, does Balaam curse Israel? He gives them blessings. See, Balaam is a symbol of Islam, and Islam is a blessing and a curse. Okay, it goes both ways. Um, when Islam came into history, in the time period of Muhammad, what it did is it wrapped itself around Europe immediately. And you know what that did? It prevented Catholicism from spreading around the world. Islam was a blessing. All right. In, uh, when the Christians during the early church fled out of Jerusalem in the persecution? Where did, where did the, the early church get established first? The strongest Christian church in Syria. In Syria, the Syrian church. And it's in the domain of Islam that that Christian church and Islam protected the manuscripts that we know to be the received text. And the received texts are the texts that are used to translate into the King James Bible. And it was Islam that protected the received text in that history. It was Islam that protected the King James Bible. While off in Alexandria, they were writing the texts that are known as Vaticanus, that are used to produce the Catholic Bibles that circulate among us today. So Islam has been a blessing and a curse, depending on how you look on it through history. That's, that's part of its prophetic DNA, all right? A blessing and a curse. Um, but on the top of page 22, there's more to be said about that, but we're not going to say everything that we can say. Notice in Genesis 16:12, it says, He will be a wild man. And this word wild, you have the, def the definition of it under the verse. It says, sense of running wild, the onager. You know what the onager is? It's the wild Arabian ass. The word that is is typically translated in the Bible as the wild Arabian ass is translated wild in Genesis 16:12 when it says and he will be a wild man you see the first time the first prophecy about the descendants of Ishmael says the symbol of Ishmael in Bible prophecy is the wild Arabian ass and what family is an ass in it's a horse 
course, Islam in Revelation chapter 9 is represented by a horse. If you don't think it is, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with that, you don't even have to test it if you don't want to, if you just exercise a little bit of faith. If Islam of the first and second woe is represented in Revelation 9, and the pioneers understood that Revelation 9 is the first and second woe, and they understood that the first and second woe was Islam, and they understood that they wanted to symbolically represent Islam of the first and second woe on these charts, ask yourself, how did they represent them? Horses. Islam is a horse in Bible prophecy. From the very first mention, he will be a wild man, a wild Arabian ass. And when he's illustrated, that's in Genesis, the beginning of the Bible, the ancient people, when he's represented in Revelation, the end of the Bible, because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Is the same in the beginning and the end. Islam is the horse. And you'll see a couple references where this word that's translated as wild man in Genesis 16, 12 is translated as the wild Arabian ass. It's a perfect symbol for Islam because Islam comes from Arabia, right? And when the traders that go on camels across the Arabian desert, and they travel in these barren deserts for long periods of time, they always take the wild Arabian ass with them. You know why? Because it can smell water through the sand. So you always have a wild Arabian ass, so if you really need to find water, you know he's going to lead you to the water. It's the perfect symbol for the nomads of Arabia. Right? Okay, now in... in First Selected Messages, book 1, page 121, Sister White says, how's, how's it start? Our greatest need in our first work is to seek for a revival. Sometimes I can do it word for word and it's not coming to me. Our greatest need, is, as she says on page 121, is to seek for a revival. This is to be our first work. And then on page 128, she says, a revival represents a renewal of spiritual life. If our first work and our greatest need is to seek for revival, what it means is that we're spiritually dead. We wouldn't need to seek for a revival if we were alive. Because that's what revival means. You're revived. And in Testimonies to Ministers, page 113, she says, When we understand the books of Daniel and Revelation as we should, there will be seen among us a great revival. The Bible, the spirit of prophecy, teaches that God's people at the end of the world, they're in the later seen condition. They're the parable of the ten virgins. All the virgins slept. At the end of the world, God's people are asleep. And the only way you wake them up, the only way that inspiration identifies, is from the prophetic word. I'll give you a second testimony to this. This is the roughest meeting usually. We're digesting all that wonderful food. And... Uh, and you'd think I don't see you when you're starting to fall asleep, but I do. And I, I, only, sir, I only let a certain handful of us fall asleep before I say something and attempt to awaken you. Okay, there might be something here that's important for you to see. Here. Yes. Turn it up or down? Oh. Okay. So I'm going to give you an illustration of what Sister White tells us very easily in First Selected Messages, Book 1, page 121, and Testimonies to Ministers, page 113 is that we need to be awakened and the way that we're awakened is through prophecy, the prophetic word. And there's a good illustration of this in Ezekiel 37. Now, I challenge you. I hope you test me. The Seventh-day Adventists living at the end of the world, when someone's standing before God's people, opening the word of God before them, they, ha they are required to go home and test to see if what that person is saying is true or not. I hope you're testing me. But one thing that I would point you to is we're going to read the first 14 verses of Ezekiel 37. And then I w if you have an Ellen White CD-ROM, I would challenge you to go look at how many times Sister White references this chapter. She, this is one of the most familiar chapters she speaks about. And she's, she says over and over again that this valley of dry bones is the Seventh-day Adventist church at the end of the world. Because you don't have to use Sister White to see that. Ezekiel's going to tell you that this valley of dry bones in Ezekiel 37 is the Seventh-day Adventist church at the end of the world because by the end of the, f the f verses that we're going to look at, these valley of dead dry bones, 
they stand up in a mighty army and it says they're the house of Israel. Who's the house of Israel at the end of the world? Seventh-day Adventist church. So these 14 verses are dealing with God's church at the end of the world. And it's going to tell us that the way they get brought back to life is through prophecy. So let's read these verse and th verses and then make some comments on them. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about and behold there were very many in the open valley and lo they were very dry. And he said unto me son of man can these bones live? And I answered O Lord God thou knowest. And he said unto me, said unto me prophesy upon these bones. And say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you. When, when, when the Lord form, formed Adam, what did he have to do to bring Adam to life? Had to breathe, alright. Cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring flesh upon you, and cover, your, cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Now what this is, these verses here, if you want to take these verses and apply them to the end of the world, okay? What, what we've read so far is the promise that every Seventh-day Adventist usually knows about. Every Seventh-day Adventist usually knows that at the end of the world something's going to happen to the Adventist church and the, the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out upon them and they're going to come to life and finish the work. We all know that, right? These verses here, this is the promise. This is the promise in this passage that this would happen in the future. But now, now Ezekiel is going to move beyond the promise and explain how it happens. Notice the next couple of verses. So I prophesied as I commanded. Okay, he's been, first he's told to prophesy, but he hasn't done it yet. But there comes a point in time now where he's going to actually prophesy. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a noise and behold a shaking and the bones came together bone to his bone and when I beheld lo the sinews and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them above but there was no breath in them. These bones become a body. How do they become a body? No, 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 we never read that. How did they become the body? There was a prophecy. Okay, so he says, so I prophesied. There's a prophecy that comes to the Adventist church, right? Ezekiel prophesied. So I prophesied, and then the, the muscles and the flesh and the sinews come upon the bones, right? Isn't that what we just read? But they weren't alive, were they? They weren't alive. It's just a body. Now, brothers and sisters, here at the time of the end, there's a prophecy that's unsealed. And it brings the body together. But it isn't until the mighty angel comes down out of heaven that the latter rain begins to sprinkle and that the breath comes in and brings the body to life. So, I mean, if you will, un if you will receive it, these verses here are talking about the unsealing that takes place in Adventism at the end of the world. But they're not yet alive. They have to have the breath. They have to have the spirit. Notice the next verse. Please notice the next verse. The next verse. The next verse is wherever all the lights start coming on. Alright? Thus, then he said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breathe, and breathe upon these slain, that they, might li they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. There's a prophecy that comes and turns the Seventh-day Adventist church into an exceeding great army army. Now, now, brothers and sisters, do you believe that all the prophets agree with one another? Because I, I can show you a place where you can find agreement. Go to Revelation 7 real quick. Revelation 7 verse 1 says this. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth nor on the sea nor on any tree. 
And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we've sealed the servants of God in, our, in their foreheads. Now, you may not remember it, but in our last presentation, we read some quotes, passages from the spirit of prophecy, where Sister White is very clear that when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down, the latter rain begins, the refreshing begins, and the sealing of the 144,000 begins. That's typical Adventist understanding, but we put the passages in there so we're clear on it. Here, in Revelation 7, verse 1 through 3, the sealing of the 144,000 begins, and it begins when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down. And what happens here is that the four winds are restrained. And if you go back to Ezekiel 37, where we were just at, it says, Then he said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds. The four winds. There's a prophecy of the four winds that in Revelation 7 marks the beginning of the sealing of the 144,000 and in Ezekiel 37 it's the prophecy of the four winds that turns the Adventist church into an exceeding great army. Do you think it's just a coincidence that Ezekiel and John are both mentioning the four winds? I don't. <laughs> Finishing off the the passage in Ezekiel it says, Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost and we are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you again into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and ye shall live. And I shall place you in your own land, then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and perform, performed it, saith the Lord. Now, the next passage on your next page, don't read ahead. Don't read ahead, I'm going to explain this. Three paragraphs of Sister White we're going to look at. Don't read ahead. I can see some of you immediately looking at the paper, alright? Don't look ahead. What we're going to do, there's three paragraphs we're going to look at here. We're going to look at paragraph number one first, and then paragraph number three. And then we'll look at paragraph number two, okay? So paragraph number one, we're on page 23. <clears throat> Just as long as those who profess the truth are serving Satan, his holy shadow will cut off their views of God in heaven. They will be as those who have lost their first love. They cannot view eternal realities. This is Laodiceans. This is you and I here at the end of the world. That which God has prepared for us is represented in Zechariah 3, 4, and 4, 12 through 14. And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? Brothers and sisters, what's prepared for us, we've looked at this more than once this week, is the golden oil that comes down through the two pipes and that is the oil that the ten virgins, the wise virgins, partake of. And what is that oil? It's the messages of God's Spirit. What's prepared for God's people at the end of the world to awaken them out of their Laodicean condition is the messages of God's Spirit that come down through the two pipes. And what are the two pipes? The Bible and Spirit of Prophecy. Okay, so she's, she's placing this first paragraph in the context of the parable of the ten virgins and she says, the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. Okay, now no notice the third paragraph. And what I want you to see in this third paragraph is that this is one of the several places where Sister White is referencing Ezekiel 37. Okay, she's, this is what she says. Shall we sleep on the very verge of the eternal world? Pardon me? No, we shouldn't sleep. But all the virgins slept. Should we sleep on the verge of the eternal world? Shall we be dull and cold or dead? Oh, that we might have in our churches the spirit and breath of God breathed into his people they might, that they might stand up on their feet and live. Where does she get that from? Ezekiel 37. Okay, she, this whole passage here, this whole passage, she's using Ezekiel 37 to demonstrate how the Lord brings Adventism back to life during the latter rain. 
All right. So now let's put in paragraph number two. The first paragraph, she says, what has been prepared for God's people is the oil that comes down through the two pipes. And then in the second paragraph it says, the Lord is full of resources. He has no lack of facilities. It is because of our lack of faith, our earthliness, our cheap talk, or our unbelief manifested in our conversation that dark shadows gather about us. Christ is not revealed in word or character as the one altogether lovely and the chiefest among 10,000. When the soul is content to lift itself up to vanity, the Spirit of the Lord can do little for it. Our short-sighted vision beholds the shadow, but cannot see the glory beyond. Angels are holding the four winds, represented as an angry horse, seeking to break loose and rush over the face of the whole earth, bearing destruction and death in its path. Shall we sleep on the very verge of the eternal world? Shall we be dull and cold and dead? Oh, that we might have in our churches the spirit and breath. Testing. It's back. Brothers and sisters, in Ezekiel 37, the prophecy that brings the dead dry bones to life is the prophecy that comes from the four winds. The prophecy of the four winds is Revelation 7 verse 1 through 3, which is also a passage that's understood in Adventism as identifying the ceiling of the 144,000. This is where Laodicea comes to life. Ezekiel and John, these are parallel passages. It's the prophecy of the four winds that produces the mighty army of Adventism. It's the prophecy of the four winds that are restrained in Revelation 7. They're restrained to mark the beginning of the sealing of the 144,000. But what does Sister White say? What do we learn from the other pipe that brings the golden oil down? That the four winds are represented by the angry horse of Bible prophecy. What's the angry horse of Bible prophecy? It's Islam. When, when Islam arrives back in prophetic history, the sealing of the 144,000 begins. The mighty angel of Revelation 18 descends. The latter rain begins to sprinkle. And the shaking of Adventism begins. And brothers and sisters, if you no longer have confidence in the foundational truths represented upon the 1843 and the 1850 charts, then chances are you're going to be willing to listen to the theologians of Adventism that will tell you publicly that they no longer accept the pioneer position of the trumpets. And that's what Jeremiah 6.17 says. They will not hearken to the sound of the trumpets. Because the third woe, Islam, is the sound of the trumpet for our day and age that marks the beginning of the latter rain. <clears throat> Page 24. In Ezekiel 37, there's a prophecy that brings the body together, but it, there's another prophecy that has to come to pour the spirit out and bring the body to life. The prophecy that brings the body to together begins when the dirt brush man 
begins to remove the seals one at a time at the time of the end when the prophecy that's sealed up is unsealed and the prophecy that's sealed up for seventh day Adventists at the end of the world is the seven thunders and the prophecy that marks the time of the end for Adventism it's probably in my pocket need a marker. <laughs> I can't believe it. No, 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 no. Setting right there. <laughs> Daniel 1140 marks the time in the end for Seventh-day Adventists. And it describes the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989. And in 1989, the dirt brush man Uns began to unseal the seven thunders. In September 11, 2001, the prophecy that comes from the four winds arrived in history, and the Lord began to breathe His Holy Spirit upon His people that would receive it. Now, notice in Revelation 7, verses 1 through 3, which you have on the top of page 24, and you should know this already. What did the angels do to the four winds in these verses? They put a restraint on them. What does Sister White say the four winds are? The angry horse. And when she says that, she says it's an angry horse that is seeking to break loose. What does it mean if you're seeking to break loose? It's being restrained. The prophetic point of reference for Islam is that it's restrained. August 11th, 1840, the four great European powers placed a restraint upon Islam. September 11, 2001, the entire world placed a restraint upon Islam. Sister White says that when the mighty angel comes down, the, revel the sealing of the 144,000 begins. That's Revelation 7, verses 1 through 3. And Sister White says that the mighty angel comes down when the great buildings of New York City come down. And that there's a restraining of the four winds at that point of time. And she also says that the four winds are the angry horse. And she places her endorsement on both those charts where it's easy to see that the angry horse of Bible prophecy is Islam. Was Islam restrained by George Bush in the United Nations on September 11, 2001? Did they, did they go in and shut down their bank accounts? Did they begin to seek out their, their whatever you call it, their activities that were undercover? Did they go, who's, who's saying no? Did they go into Afghanistan? Did they go into Iraq? Is, there was a restraint placed upon Islam. And you and I will have to discuss it later. Okay. All right. There was a restraint placed upon Islam. Now let's look at this restraint because that's what, you know, I know what the question is. I get this every time. I've already got it once today. Uh, you get it every time. And here's the question. I'll be out front with you. Brother Jeff, don't you realize that it was George Bush, the Jesuits, and the CIA that brought down the Twin Towers on September 11? And my response is this. It doesn't matter who brought down the Twin Towers. The prophetic fulfillment is the restraining of Islam. And there was a restraint placed upon Islam at that time. Paralleling the restraint upon Islam here. So... In Reve in Islam is an angry horse. You can see the verses in Revelation 9 that are used to identify Islam of the first and second woe. And they are described as a horse. And you can see both the endorsements of the 1843 and the 1850 chart where the angry horse of Islam is illustrated. When the pioneers read Revelation 9, they understood that Islam was best represented on those charts by a horse, which is its prophetic DNA. Now you'll notice, if you, this on the bottom where it says death and destruction, Sister White says, angels are holding the four winds represented as an angry horse seeking to break loose and rush over the face of the whole earth, bearing death and destruction in its path. In the first woe, and the first woe, the history of the first woe begins in, in the time of Muhammad, all right? It's the beginning of the seventh century. First of all, begins in the beginning of the 7th century, and it goes all the way 
1449. So the history of the first woe is about 700 years. There wasn't anyone that lived for 700 years in that time period. All right. So in verse 11 of Revelation 9, and verse 11 of Revelation 9 is dealing with the first woe. Here's what it says. And they, Islam, had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, and the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Now some people say that this angel is Satan. That, fine, I'm not going to argue with that. The, it can be Satan in his primary sense, and, a, and it can be Muhammad, in, or the Quran in a secondary sense. But what it's identifying is the, what's a name identifying Bible prophecy? Character. It's saying the character, the prophetic characteristic of Islam is represented in these two names. And what do these two names mean? Um, I have this in here. Death and destruction is what their names mean. But I don't, maybe I already passed over it. Bottom of what? 24. No, 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 no. I had, to, I had pulled the definition out of a dictionary. Apollyon Abaddon, Abaddon mean death and destruction. So when Sister White says angels are, are holding the four winds, represented as an angry horse, seeking to break loose, an angry horse that's restrained, seeking to break loose and bring death and destruction in its path, when Islam is being identified in verse 11, the prophetic characteristics of Islam is death and destruction. So Sister White's identifying this angry horse that's the four winds in the same terminology of Apollyon and Abaddon, which is the character of Islam. Do you follow my logic? Do, you, do you, everyone with me on this? Say amen. Do you think it's an accident that the characteristic of Islam is found in Revelation 9-11? It's chapter 9, verse 11. 9-11. Some people, when I say that, they basically say, you really, you've stepped out of theological reality there. My brothers and sisters, how many of you have read Testimonies? Volume 9, page 11. Brothers and sisters, there are no accidents in the Word of God. There's never been a more important point in history than September 11, 2001 in terms of God's people because this is where the sealing of the 144,000 begins. And every fact that the Lord has provided for us to see should be considered in the light of eternity. Revelation 9.11 is telling us that the characteristic of Islam is to bring death and destruction. <clears throat> Notice under parallel history on page 25. The first and second angel's message. The Millerite history is the history of the first and second angel's message. The first and second angel's message are still truth for this time and are to run parallel with that which follows. That's what we're doing here. This is the history of the third angel down here. And we're saying that in this history there was a two-step work. Why am I saying two-step work? Some of you weren't here earlier this week. We looked at the Spirit of Prophecy quotes where Sister White says the angels in Revelation represent the work that the people of God do. The first angel's message arrived in 1798. It was empowered in 1840. The pioneers taught, we took time with this, the pioneers taught that the first angel of Revelation 14, 6, and 7 and the angel of Revelation 10 that comes down out of heaven right here, it's the same angel. Because it's the first angel. But the angels aren't angels. The angels are symbols of the work that is accomplished. The, the work of the first angel in 1798 was to run to and fro in the prophetic word. This is the work God's people do to understand the message for that time. When that message was understood then in 1840, that message was empowered by the confirmation of the year day principle. Then that message tested this generation and by June of 1842, the Protestants began to close their door against that message and the second angel's message had arrived. Then there was a divine pronouncement that the message had been rejected, Babylon has fallen, that ended in judgment. That which follows the first and second angel's message is the third angel's message, and it's to run parallel with it. In 1989, 
with the collapse of the Soviet Union and fulfillment of Daniel 11 verse 40. Prophetic light was shed upon this generation because the very next verse, Daniel 11:41, defi- identifies a Sunday law in the United States where probation closes for Seventh-day Adventists. And the Bible says, Surely the Lord thy God will do nothing except he reveal it through his servants, the prophets. And verse 40 was designed, and the collapse of the Soviet Union was designed to wake up Seventh-day Adventists to the reality that the next thing that happens in prophecy is that their probation is about to close. This is the place where the body comes together. Sinew, flesh, and muscle upon the bones. But there is no breath in it yet. Here, on September 11th, 2001, paralleling this history here, there's a restraint placed upon Islam. Paralleling this history, a mighty angel comes down, a mighty angel comes down. The very principle that this message is built upon that principle being that the Millerite history is repeated in the 144,000. It's confirmed. Same thing happened here as happened here. Restraint of Islam. We're now moving to the closing of the door. But the door that closes in this history first is the door of Adventism. And it takes place once again with the activities of Protestant America at the Sunday Law. We're right here. This is Daniel 11 verse 40. This is Daniel 11 verse 41. And we're on borrowed time. We're now in the time period where the angels come down out of heaven and the testing process has begun. In Revelation 9 verse 14 and 15. Unfortunately, because we are Laodiceans, all of us, I'm not speaking down to anyone, we're not familiar with that prophecy anymore. This prophecy right here. This prophecy right here. This prophecy here is a prophecy of 150 years that took place in the time period of the first woe. And at its conclusion, this prophecy here began. And it's a prophecy of 391 years and 50 days. You find that prophecy in Revelation 9, verse 14 and 15. Notice what it says. Saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels. You see back here, this chart isn't big enough. Here where it says 1449, on July 27th, 1449, back here, there are four angels that are loosed. Everyone watching? And these angels are going to be loose for an hour, a year, a month, and a day, which adds up to 391 years and 15 days. So this time prophecy is coming through history here, and it ends right there on August 11th, 1840. This is 391 years and 15 days. Now, notice in this verse, verse 15, And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay a third part of men. Now, brothers and sisters, back here in 1449, where my hand is, this is where they're loosed. And these four angels representing Islam of the Ottoman Empire... They're loosed until the conclusion of the prophecy. So when the prophecy concludes, what are they? They're restrained. At the beginning of the prophecy, they're loosed. When the time prophecy comes to an end, they're restrained. So in the Millerite history, in the Millerite history, prophetically, what marks the arrival of the angel coming down prophetically in this prophecy is when Islam is restrained. That's prophetically. But historically they were restrained too. Notice Islam historically restrained on your notes. It's a sister white. At the very time specified, Turkey through her ambassadors accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. When it became no multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates and a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. Men of learning and position united with Miller both in preaching and publishing his views and from 1840 to 1844 the work rapidly extended. The event historically that marked the conclusion of this time prophecy was a restraint that was put on Islam. You see brothers and sisters the first woe, the history that the the Millerites identified as the history of the first woe. Islam identifies that identical history. You know what Islam calls the history of the first woe? 
the history of the first great jihad. And the history that we as Adventists and the Millerites identify as the history of the second woe. From 1449 to 1844. You know what Islam calls that history? The second great jihad. And at the end of this time period in, in 1840, Egypt, an Islamic country, wanted to carry on the jihad that was coming to an end. And the reason it was coming to an end is the Ottoman Empire was depleted of its power. It was the sick man of the East. And the jihad was over. And Egypt determined that it was going to invade Turkey, capture its army, and become the new power of Islam and carry on the jihad. And Egypt had the money to do it. Egypt had the money, but Egypt did not have the foot soldiers. So Egypt formed an alliance with a brand new religion in Saudi Arabia, an Islamic religion. You know what, what that religion is called? Called Wahhabism. Who said that? Wahhabism. So Wahhabism and Egypt come together in this time period to carry on the jihad. But Europe, the four great powers of Europe, they look at this situation and they say, we've had enough of this warfare with Islam and we're not going to let this happen. And they intercede into this history and they place a restraint upon Egypt, saying, you either back down or you're going to deal with us. And they were restrained historically. They were restrained prophetically. And of course, on September 11, 2001, What's the religion of Ben Laden? It's Wahhabism. And modern Islam will tell you that the third great jihad, the third and final jihad, began on September 11th, 2001. So, it's the religion of the house of Saad to this day. Now look at Revelation 7.1. Just as Islam was prophetically restrained in the history of the Millerites, Sister White tells us that the four winds are represented as an angry horse seeking to break loose and bring death and destruction. And in Revelation 7, 1, those four winds are restrained. So right here in this history, at a prophetic level, Islam is restrained just as Islam was restrained at a prophetic level in this history. Okay, you see that? And Islam was restrained historically. Notice under Islam historically restrained on 9-11. How many of you remember this quote? This is George Bush, September 2001. Every nation in the region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. And at that point in time, there was a restraint placed upon Islam. Now in the Millerite history, if you, if you wonder what I mean by descending power, in this history, this event, it marks when the angel of Revelation 10 descends. We've read a quote earlier where the pioneers understood that. And it marks where the angel descends in our history. In the, the prophecy of Ishmael, it says that his hand will be against every man. I don't have this in your notes. If you set your notes down for a moment, I'll, I'll show you one thing real quickly. I, I didn't pay attention to where we started. We started about 2.30. No, we got time. Okay. Revelation 13, verse 2. Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. This is, this, I'm going to share some things with you that sometimes aren't understood in Adventism, but it's... It's correct, standard understanding. I'm not making, putting my own interpretation on any of this. In verse 2 of Revelation 13, it says this. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth was as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. This is the papal beast. Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. In the beginning of the papacy, the papacy was given three things. Power, seat, 
in the Tory, 496, Clovis began the process of the European kings giving their financial and military support to the papacy. They gave their power to the papacy in 496. In the year 330, Constantine moved the capital of the Roman Empire from the city of Rome to the city of Constantinople. P the dragon, pagan Rome, gave its seat to the papacy in the year 330. It gave its power to the papacy in the year 496, but it gave its civil authority to the papacy in the year 533 in the decree of Justinian. In 533, Justinian wrote a legal document. And you've got to understand, when was the first Sunday law? 321. And what's the principle connected with the Sunday law? So, the Sunday law comes in 321. In the year 330, Constantine divides the kingdom into east and west and immediately thereafter the trumpets of revelation begin to blow and the Roman Empire begins to disintegrate whereby in the year 476 the former strong empire has first been divided into east and west and by 476 it's the ten kingdoms of Daniel chapter 7. It's disintegrating. But Justinian's decree is 50 years after that in 533, 60 years after that. By this time his kingdom is just really falling apart. Why is it falling apart? Because of the trumpet powers. That's what the Bible identifies. It's the trumpet powers that take the Roman Empire apart. So in 533, the king of Rome, his kingdom is falling apart. Right? So what he does is he determines that to solidify his political well-being, he's going to intercede into a religious controversy that's going on in the religious world and say that it's the Church of Rome that is the head of the churches and that it's the Church of Rome that is the corrector of heretics. That's the first time the civil authority was given to the papacy. Turn to Revelation 17, 17. Speaking of the ten kings in verse 17 of Revelation 17 it says, For God has put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast. Now these ten kings, we haven't went through Revelation 17, but these ten kings, it's easy to see who these ten kings are. All the, all the prophets agree with one another. Who's Jezebel? It's the papacy at the end of the world. Who was Jezebel married to? Ahab. Ahab was the king of how many tribes? Ten tribes. These ten kings are the civil authority that's given to Jezebel, the papacy, at the end of the world, right? It's easy to see. Lots of places to show it in prophecy. And they agree to give their kingdom to the beast. They don't want to. They're forced to. So if at the end of the world, in Revelation 17, 17, the civil authority is given to the papacy, and at the beginning history of the papacy, the civil authority was given to the papacy, if we know Christ, then we know that Christ illustrates the end from the beginning. So why was it that the civil authority was given to the papacy in the beginning? Because if we can figure that out, we'll know why the civil authority is given to the papacy at the end of the world. Why was it that the civil authority was given to the papacy in 533? Because the world was being brought to its knees by a trumpet power. Hmm. What's the trumpet power at the end of the world? It's the seventh trumpet. But the seventh trumpet is the third woe. And what's the first woe? Islam. What's the second woe? What's the third woe? That's the seventh trumpet. Islam at the end of the world. His man will be against every man. And every man's hand is going to come together against him. Islam creates the issue that brings church and state together in the world between the United Nations, the Ten Kings, and the Papacy. And in that coming together, you know what happens? The civil authority. Have you read the recent encyclical? You ought to read the recent encyclical. It's right in agreement with what we're saying here. The Pope is saying, you need to give some muscle to the United Nations. In that process of the United Nations, the ten kings agreeing to give their civil authority over the world to the papacy, you know what else they do? They say the Pope of Rome is the corrector of heretics. What heretics? Well, the world's going to be brought to its knees by Islam. And the Pope's going to be put in a position where he can determine that this branch of Islam is unacceptable, but this branch of Islam is acceptable. 
Now, brothers and sisters, let me, let me back up a little bit. Remember the three Elijahs? The first Elijah had to deal with the threefold power. Jezebel, Ahab, and the prophets of Baal. Right? There was a deception that went on in that story. After Carmel, after Carmel, Ahab runs back to, Carm to Jezebel in Samaria and he says, you won't believe it. Elijah's God is the true God. He, he brought fire down out of heaven. I'm certain that he's the true God. My God's the true God. Jezebel, your God isn't right. And what did she say? I want him dead right away. But there was a second Elijah, right? John the Baptist. He was deceived too by Jezebel, wasn't he? Only it was Herodias. After Salome does her dance of deception, he gets up there and he says, up to half my kingdom I will give you for that wonderful dance. What do you want? Did he think she was going to say, I want the head of John the Baptist in a charger? See, in both those stories, the civil power, Ahab and Herod, they're deceived to the intentions of Jezebel and Herodias. And Jezebel and Herodias' intention is to deal with Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath keepers at the end of the world. There's a deception that takes place. Remember when Saddam Hussein was, was captured? There was a controversy that went on in the world. The controversy was, do we try Saddam Hussein in the world court that does not believe in the death penalty, or do we try him in Iraq that does believe in the death penalty? There was a controversy there, and at that time, the last pope, Pope John Paul II, he began writing encyclicals saying, the Catholic Church does not believe in the death penalty. We, death penalty. we need to try Saddam Hussein in the world court. Do you remember that? Do you think that the Catholic Church doesn't believe in the death penalty? See, the Catholic Church, it's already preparing the mentality for the globalist guys to think it doesn't believe in the death penalty. And Islam is already bringing the world to its knees. Did you hear what OPEC did here recently? They said within six years, we're changing what we buy oil with in the er world. You don't have to wait six years. Right there, it lets the whole world know that the dollar, it's going down well before six years. That's Islam. That's Islam impacting the economy of the United States. What about Iran? Do you think the Jews, the Israel's going to wait for much longer before they go deal with those nuclear facilities in Iran? Even if it doesn't start a war, what's it going to do to the price of oil? And what about our economy here in the United States? How much more can it take before it just really takes the plunge? That's Islam. Do you think it would be out of character if Islam could get away with it for them to do something really nasty in the United States? Brothers and sisters, the four winds, they, they're restrained here. But they continue to bring the world to its knees. And there comes a point in time where the United States, it's the false prophet, the United States is going to go to the world and say the only way that we can deal with the escalating crisis of radical Islam is to bring the umbrella, bring the world under the umbrella of a one world government, the United Nations. And we're going to place the greatest moral authority in the world today on top of this. That's what Sister White says that's what the Bible says. That's what logic tells us. And the greatest moral authority in the world today is the Pope of Rome. And they're going to make him the head of the churches. And they're going to say, you can be the one that is the corrector of heretics. And you can clean up the mess of Islam. And as soon as he is in position, the United Nations, the dragon power, the ten kings, they're going to realize they've been deceived just like Ahab and Herodias because the Pope of Rome don't care about Islam at all. He's going to deal with Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath keepers. It's all there in prophecy. But, prophecy says the issue that makes this happen is that the descendants of Ishmael, their hands are going to be against every man and every man's hand is going to come together against Islam. And it's, it runs throughout Bible prophecy if you care to look. But as Laodiceans... We don't generally care to look. There's, there's a, a group of men in this part of the vineyard that say the pioneers taught that the third woe are the events that take place after Michael stands up, human probation closes. And this is true almost. And these men say that I claim to hold the pioneer position, but that I say the third woe arrives when probation is still open. 
Well, I'm here to tell you, they're wrong. Notice verse 18 of Revelation 11, under the angering of the nations. Yes, it's in your notes, page 26, Revelation 11, verse 18. It says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. When's God's wrath? Seven last plagues, all right? You know, shortly after 1844, Joseph Bates wrote an article about this verse, and he says, Everything in this verse happens at the same time. The angering of the nations, the, the wrath of God, the time to judge the dead, giving reward to the servants, the prophets. Immediately after Joseph Bates wrote that article, you know what Sister White did? She wrote an article that you can find in early writings, and here's what it says. Early writings, page 36. I saw that the anger of the nations, the wrath of God, and the time to judge the dead were separate and distinct, one following another. See, the angering of the nations, it's separate and distinct from the wrath of God, and the wrath of God is the seven last plagues. The wrath of God is something that takes place when probation is closed, but the angering of the nations is something that takes place before probation closes. And this, this here, in verse 14 of Revelation 11, it says, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. That's verse 14 of Revelation 11. Verse 18 is just the commentary on the third woe. Verse 18, this is part of the story of the third woe. Yes, the third woe does encompass the, the judgment of the seven last plagues. I'm not denying that. But there's a part of the third woe that comes before probation close, closes called the angering of the nations. Notice what it says from James White under held in check. Speaking of the angering of the nations. This being the period for the fulfillment of the words of the prophet and the nations were angry, we may reasonably assume, expect that not only the nations of Europe will make great preparations for war and even advance to battle, but that our own nation and all the nations of the earth, all the nations of the earth may become unsettled and angry. But at the same time, notice what, what, what James White knows. What does Sister White say about James White? She says, when it comes to Bible doctrine, he fulfilled the role of Moses to the Advent people. She doesn't say he's inspired. But if you're going to read a pioneer, just remember, when it comes to Bible doctrine, Sister White says that James White fulfilled the role of Moses to the Advent people. And what he's saying is at the same time, the, the four angels will hold the four winds in check so that the great slaughter will be pre prevented till the servants of God shall be sealed. James White is saying the angry, angering of the nations takes place in the sealing of the 144,000 before probation closes. And of course, the angering of the nations is a component of the third woe. And of course, the third woe is Islam. And Islam is the power that brings every man's hand together against it. Now notice what Sister White says about this same information. This view was given in 1847 when there were but very few Advent brethren observing the Sabbath. And the, of these, but few supposed that its observance was sufficient important to draw a line between the people of God and unbelievers. Now, the fulfillment of that view is being seen. Everyone with me? The commencement of that time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plague shall begin to be poured out, but to a short period just before they are poured out while Christ is in the sanctuary. There's a time of trouble that takes place while Christ is still involved in the investigative judgment. It's not when probation closes. And now here's what she says. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming, up on, the er coming on the earth. The nations will be angry, yet held in check. What are the angry nations? They're Islam. And at the very close of the investigative judgment, the angry nations are held in check. Islam was held in check here. Islam was held in check here. Now notice what she says. Let's read that again. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth. And the nations will be angry, yet held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angels. And at that time, the latter rain or refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come. Yeah. When were they held in check? September 11th, 2001, and the latter rain and the refreshing arrived. Is that not the same page number as what? As the what? Yeah, 
Yeah? What about it? I'm not understanding your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we, had, we don't have time to go through 9-11, but uh, the sequence of, brothers and sisters, the sequence of events in Testimonies, Volume 9-11, it, 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 the title called The Last Crisis, that's the, ta the chapter. And what's the first words in the chapter after the title? We're now living in what? The time of the end. But even before the title, she has something very provocative. But we don't have time to go there. <laughs> it's definitely, it's definitely, brothers and sisters, 9-11 is when the angering of the nations begin and at the same time the angering of the nations arrive, they are restrained to mark when the angel comes down in the beginning of the latter rain. Now notice in Revelation 7, it says, I saw another angel ascending from the east. What's ascending mean? Arising from the east. The sealing message, which is the message of the four winds in Ezekiel 37. Right? That's where the latter rain begins. When the four winds represented by the angry horse are restrained by the four angels. The sealing of the 144,000 begins. The message of the four winds is what brings God's people to life into a mighty army. The message of the four winds is Revelation 7 verse 1 through 3. But it's the message of the east. And it ascends. It progresses. Truth is progressive. It escalates. It grows. It's an increase of knowledge. And it's a message that comes from the East, is it not? How many of you know who Louis Weir is? You're looking like maybe you're running out of time? No? Okay. How many know who Louis Weir is? Louis Weir is a deceased Australian Seventh-day Adventist pastor that's written many, many books on prophecy. Some of the things I don't agree with, but a lot of the stuff is very, very good. Okay, they're, they're, it's just very good. But he does something very nice. He takes the genealogy in Genesis from Noah, from Adam to Noah, and he takes the definition of those names, Adam on down through Noah, and he takes the definitions and he puts them into a sentence, and you realize that the meaning of their names from in the genealogy tells the story of the gospel. And then he takes the names of the 144,000 in Revelation 7, does the same thing, takes the definitions of the names, strings it into a statement, and it tells the story of the 144,000. Now notice, you have this worked out for you. You see under the children of the East, Genesis 5, you see the names in the genealogy. Adam means man, Seth means appointed, Enos means wretched, you see it? You follow what, the logic of what he does? After he puts the definitions in place, then he's going to put the definitions into a statement. Notice the statement. Man was appointed mortal, frail, and wretched, fixed in this world, and lamenting his condition. But the blessed of God promised to descend, teaching that his death would bring weary, rest to the weary. Wow, do you think it's an accident that all those names identify that truth? Yeah, there's something in the name. Now, now notice about the, the 12 tribes of the 144,000. Judah, let God be praised and celebrated. Reuben, behold the son. Gad, good fortune. Okay. If you string that into a sentence, it says, God will be celebrated and praised by the 144,000 as they behold the son and press together in honesty. They will wrestle with God and God will forget their sins and answer to their prayers and they will come into unity and receive the reward of the Holy Spirit living within their habitation while exalting Christ as they are added to the redeemed and set down at Christ's right hand. Is that not a statement of the 144,000? And it's, it's, it's drawn right from their names. It, it, it clicked on. That, you know... What if, if he did it in Genesis, and he did it in Revelation 7, I wonder what would happen if you looked at the twelve sons of Ishmael. Hmm. Let's look at the twelve sons of Ishmael. And you'll see in Genesis 25, the twelve sons listed there. And the first son is, and forgive me for pronouncing his names, but Nebuchadnezzar. Which means fruitfulness. And of course, Islam's a pretty fruitful people, is it not? Yes. All right. Qadar, the second, means dusky, of skin, ashy, dark colored. But it, it goes on by implication to mourn in sackcloth or sordid garments, to cause to mourn. They were famous warriors. The third son was 
Adbil, which means to grieve, to languish. Mibsam means fragrant, fragrance by implication, spicery. And you know that Islam and Israel always had to stay in relationship with one another because the, the Israelites were going to operate the sanctuary on earth which required certain spices that were only grown in Saudi Arabia. And in order to get those spices, Israel always had to maintain a trade relationship with Islam. Okay? Because that's where the spices come from. Of course, that's one of the names of one of the sons. Mishma means a report, to hear intelligently. Duma means to be dumb or silence, but it means more than that. When you look at the definition closely, it means the silence of death. It means really to be silent. Masa means burden, tribute, utterance. A prophecy of doom. It's a prophecy, an oracle of doom. Hadar means chamber or apartment, or to enclose, or to beset, as a as a siege, isn't it something that Islam enclosed Europe as it brought the siege against Europe? Tema, the son of Ishmael, the region settled by him from Arabia. Jeter, encircled, enclosed, hence the wall. Now notice number 11. This is the one that just blows my mind. What do you suppose nefish means? Refreshed. You see, Islam's Islam and prophecy marks the beginning of the refreshing in the history of the Millerites and it marks the beginning of the refreshing in the history of the 144,000. And the 12th son, Kadima, means the children of the East. So in Revelation 7, which is the prophecy of the four winds, which according to Ezekiel 37 verse 9, is the prophecy that brings Adventism back to life and the four winds according to Sister White are the angry horse seeking to break loose and bring death and destruction, the angry horse that is restrained. In Revelation 7, this message that seals the 144,000 is the message that ascends, that comes up and it comes from the east and lo and behold, Islam in Bible prophecy are the children of the east. And if you put these 12 names together, this is what they mean. The sons of Ishmael will be a fruitful warring people of dark skin centered in Arabia that will bring warring upon the land as they bring the silence of death upon mankind. They were prophetically grieved in 1840 and 2001. They will supply the spices necessary they will supply the spices necessary for the sanctuary and will be a subject of prophecy. They will encircle and close and besiege Europe, Europe thus preventing the spread of Catholicism as they fill not, fulfill not only a curse but a blessing. Prophetically they are the children of the East and as such they provide the prophetic symbol that marks the refreshing that began with their restraint on August 11th, 1840 and on September 11th, 2001. Islam is a subject of prophecy and it's a subject of prophecy that marks the beginning of the latter reign and the testing process in Adventism. Shall we pray? <coughs> Father, we wish to be those people that are represented by Re Bereans that are students that test the things that we hear, compare them scripture to scripture to see if they're so. I ask that you'd put a burden on each and every heart that hears this material on these tapes or is listening here this Sabbath day here in this room, that they're convicted to test these things. If they find through prayer and study that these things are not so, then so be it. But Lord, let no one leave this room with the attitude that they can put the investigation of this subject off for some future date, for if these things are so, Seventh-day Adventists must understand these things immediately, and we wish to understand this increase, this escalating message that you're bringing to your people at this time. We thank you for being here with us throughout this day so far. We ask for your continued blessing in the following meetings. We thank you and praise you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.